Hello, this is a short online lecture about self-directed research as part of the How to Succeed as a Student series of lectures. Today we're going to be looking at self-directed research and how to achieve it efficiently and effectively. Specifically, the aim is to increase your skills at independent research, including criticality of your judgment, your confidence at undertaking research, um, the ethics of how to do uh, appropriately ethical research as a student, uh, and your motivation to undertake self-directed research. Another purpose is to increase employability because finding things out is a very, very cross-transferable skill. It's also to encourage a reflective approach to research and how you use your own findings and those of others within your work at university. We're also going to briefly touch on plagiarism and how you can avoid it. Um, and we're going to look at some resources that will help you get support for the study tasks. Why are these things important? Well, firstly, students with strong academic research skills tend to do better in assessments. Um, it's to help you identify and then use a scholarly approach as you continue in your student journey. Scholars also need to be ethical, and it's very important that we give you the skills you need to avoid accidental plagiarism and any other academic offences, as well as to pursue self-directed research in an ethical manner. Knowing how to do research, knowing how to find things out, opens up huge opportunities for you in terms of your future learning and your future pathways in life as well as in study. So these are incredibly useful and highly transferable skills that will benefit you. OK, so what is self-directed research? Self-directed learning is a process of deciding what you want and then taking steps to achieve it. And if you watch the first video in this series, you'll have seen this flow chart before. You set a goal, you make a plan for how to achieve that goal, you then engage in the learning, and you measure your progress against the initial goal. And if you need to, you repeat. Self-directed research is very much like self-directed learning, except it's focused on a scholarly inquiry. You find out some facts, you do some investigation and interpretation of those facts, you form a position on those facts, and you might end up suggesting new knowledge as a result of your research. So the flowchart instead looks, looks like this. You firstly define a question. What is it that you're trying to find out? Then you find out what others know. And you can see here that sometimes finding out what other people know, what knowledge is already out there, then helps you to redefine your own inquiry and redefine your question. You then interpret the knowledge that you've gained and the knowledge that you've accessed. And there might be an element here of creating new data, doing an original inquiry, whether practice-based or based on a survey, some sort of new inquiry that gives you new knowledge that nobody had before. And then the final step is you relate back to that original question. Have you answered it? What have you learned? And does it affect uh, the, the, the way that you've asked that original question? And again, here, what you've learned may well easily go back to the start and help you to redefine that question. And in truth, scholarly inquiry is a series of repetitions of this flowchart. It's extremely rare that you would only go through this once. So it's an iterative process of finding things out, redefining what you already know, redefining what you now want to find out, and then going round again. Here's an example. Let's look at a short example. So you will be asked to do small research inquiries as part of your ongoing learning. So in this example, we're going to um, assume that you've been asked to comment on an artwork by Margaret MacDonald. So the first question is, who is or who was Margaret MacDonald? You may already be, fam be familiar with her, you may not. Um, if you already know Margaret MacDonald, then you have to decide which artwork are you going to choose to comment on. So how are you going to discover these things? Are you going to use Google? Is that the best source you could be using? Spoiler, no, it isn't. 
So who are you going to ask? How are you going to use people as information sources? Are you going to use your tutors or your fellow students? How are you going to find this out? What are you going to do? And this, of course, can feed back into the original inquiry. Once you're ready, you start doing a deeper investigation. You might find a series of images. You might look at some work that's already been written about the, the artworks in question. Are you going to visit them? Uh, where are you going to visit them? Are you going to just look at them online? So you're going to do a much deeper investigation, which will inform your choice of artwork to comment on. And of course, your own preferences come into this as well. There might be one that you simply like better than the others or one that you find more interesting. So again, all of these things can feed back into the initial question and help you to redefine your area of inquiry. And then after several iterations, you are going to choose a work, you have something interesting to say about it, and you're going to cite that work. Talking now about research skills. InfoSmart is a, a, a resource provided by GSA. It is a portfolio of online and interactive modules in information and research skills. It can help you substantially develop and improve your research capabilities and to really take charge of your learning and importantly to make all your research inquiries a much more efficient process so that you're not wasting your time typing things into Google when there are much more relevant uh, and fruitful sources you could be using. It's been specifically designed for learning, teaching and research communities in art design and architecture, but it also has generic skills for anybody who's doing research inquiry. So don't worry if your core subject is not one of those, it will still be able to help you. So it's a suite of, of modules on information skills and how you can develop them. And here is the URL. Very briefly, then, an overview of the InfoSmart process, and this is common to information skills um, modules across the board, but this is the way we've defined them at GSA. So firstly, it's material about defining your information need. What is it that you're looking for? How are you going to find it? So, for instance, the development of good keywords when you're searching, it's much more complicated than you might think it is. Um, how do you select sources and the right kind of sources that satisfy your information needs and that don't waste your time? Secondly, how to find, how to actually find this additional information, how to use the sources to find what you need quickly and effectively. It also talks about evaluation of information. This is a critically important, especially in the very, very information rich society that we live in. You can always find information on something, but how do you know how much to trust that information and how accurate it may be? What's the best sources of information? And if you're using different sorts of sources, how can you critically evaluate which ones to give more credence to? It also has modules on how to cite the information you find as references and how to produce bibliographies and reference lists. We'll very briefly cover this later in this lecture. And finally, how can you use information safely within the law? So how can you avoid um, accidentally breaching copyright on works? So InfoSmart, I would like to set you a little bit of homework after this video. Could you make using InfoSmart your new professional development goal. And I think that this might be the single most important piece of learning that you do this year, because these are highly important and highly transferable skills that will stand you in very good stead as you progress in your study. If you put the time in now, I guarantee it will save you time in the long run and improve the quality of your searching. So have a look at this link for InfoSmart. Have a look at what's there. If there's something that's not relevant to you, simply ignore it. That's fine. But make a note of where it is for the when the time comes that you do need it. We're now going to move on to a, a very brief overview about quotations, citations and referencing. So quoting is to copy somebody else's words exactly or nearly exactly. And generally, you should avoid quotations unless they're directly relevant to your work. The rule of thumb I use 
is that if some if the original words said it in a way that is just perfect for my purposes and I couldn't say it better myself, then I quote it. But if I can add some interpretation, some analysis, um, then I, I will tend to do that instead of quoting the work directly. And this is a good point to consider that if you're quoting a lot in your work, that's a sign that you're perhaps not doing enough original work and that your assessment might not be graded too well because you're simply regurgitating the work of others. So use that as a little test to yourself. If you're quoting too much, that's a sign that you need to put more original work into the assessment. It's worth noting that the reader is quite often blind to quotations. And what I mean by this is that when you're reading something, your eye can skip over quotations. Um, so a good test for this is to make sure that anything you're writing makes sense without the quotations. So have a read of the text before and after the quotation to ensure that your essay still makes sense when you've removed that quotation, and it should do. So you should aim for no more than a small number of quotations of a few words. And critically importantly, you should always ensure that the quotation is clearly separated from your own writing, from your own words. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about this later. One last thing to add here is that if you paraphrase something, that is you reword it, but it's saying exactly the same as the original source, that should be treated the same as a quotation. So you should cite it in exactly the same way that you would cite a quotation. Let's have a look at an example. OK, so this is an example of uh, an article that I wrote many years ago, uh, and I'm not going to dwell on uh, it in detail, but I just want to highlight the three different ways of quoting. Here, there is a, a very lengthy quotation, uh, which is indented and has quote marks to separate it from my words. And um, there is also a citation here. Now, this is a website. Uh, if this was a, um, a book or a journal article, you would add a page number within the citation, which is the exact page that this uh, text appears on. The reason that quote is used there is because it says it better than I could say it because it's an extract from a, a technical plan requirements document. It also makes clear to the reader that nothing's been changed when I've um, added this into the work. It's a direct quote from the, from the original source. These things here, the three dots, they're called ellipses, uh, a singular ellipsis, plural ellipses. Um, and what that means is you've cut something out, you, you've, you've extracted some words there and you put an ellipsis in to make it clear to the reader that you've edited the original quote. So that's a lengthy quote. I wouldn't expect to see something that lengthy in a student assessment, uh, but this was for a journal. The second example is here. Uh, and you'll see that it's a quotation that has been embedded in a sentence. So this sentence runs into the quotation and continues afterwards. Again, it's separated by the use of quote marks and there is a citation here right next to the quote. And again, that's a website. So if it was a book, you'd include a page number. The third way is a paraphrase. And this is very important that you treat paraphrases the same way as you would treat a quotation. So it says, here, you know, again, it's embedded in a sentence. It says an identified need for training to, prov to be provided at an early stage of a researcher's career. And then there are three citations. And that's because this point, this identified need was, was talked about in all three of these uh, original sources. So that's how you would paraphrase uh, from sources and still cite them. And once again, if this was a, a printed source, you would be using page numbers here. OK, so what is citation then? It's defined as the acknowledgement of information obtained from a document you have read or the act of quoting text. Now, this isn't just about text. It also applies to any original source. So you can cite images, you can cite films, uh, you can cite blogs and there are guidelines um, in the resource I provided at the end for how to do that. Essentially, it's the act of acknowledging the original source from from which the media you're using came. And it's done by providing a reference to that source as seen above. 
the purpose of this is simply to allow the reader to find the original source, to look at it for themselves. That's the overall purpose of citation. However, there are lots more reasons why you might cite, why you want to cite. Firstly, is it supports your statements and arguments. It gives your work credibility. Um, it helps tutors and other readers to see that you haven't just made up your position from, from no knowledge at all. It evidences the work that you've consulted and it provides credit to those sources um, for the, the authors or the artists who've produced those original sources. So essentially to not credit them is like stealing their ideas. So that's why you must always credit the work of others when you're using it in your own work. It also provides a very clear demonstration of all the background research you've done before submitting a piece of your own work. So it, it allows you to, to demonstrate the work that's gone into um, a piece of writing or uh, anything that you hand in as part of an assessment. And again, it gives it credibility. It shows people that you know what you're talking about and that your position uh, on this topic is, is based in, other, in evidence. When and where do you cite? Well, you should cite every single time you use somebody else's ideas or words or illustrations, even if you've changed them a bit. If you are directly using it, even if you reflect on it, if you change it, if you disagree with it, you still need to cite that work. Uh, it applies if you're copying some lines of program code, uh, if you're engaging in programming, that must be cited the same way you would for written text. Um, whenever you make an assertion, you know, if you say something uh, as fact, then you need to provide a reference to, to academic sources to evidence that fact. The exception here is um, if something is already known as being general knowledge. So you wouldn't need to cite, for example, that the world is round, despite what some people may tell you. Um, citation applies to images and multimedia too. Essentially, anything that you use should be cited, no matter the medium that it, that it arrived in. Uh, and you will be asked typically to include a list of references at the end of any assignments that you hand in. This could be in the form of a reference list or a bibliography or uh, just a, a series of, of original sources that you've looked at as a list. It depends on the assignment. But you will be asked to, to provide somewhere uh, a formal list of references, which is the full reference as opposed to the abbreviated citation so that readers can find the original sources on which your work is based. So let's talk a little bit about plagiarism and how to avoid it. So plagiarism is a, the term for an academic offence, which is used to describe the use of somebody else's work in your own work without acknowledging that it's not your own work or giving the other author credit. So in an academic context, plagiarism occurs when a student submits as your own work um, something that you're not actually the, the creator or the author of it. It also occurs if a student does not acknowledge the work of another person and, and hasn't correctly identified the source um, or cited quotations. Um, so if your work's found to contain other people's work in the form of quotations or paraphrases um, or images that you haven't cited, then plagiarism has com been committed whether or not you intended to deceive. So it's really important that you take steps to, to make sure that you don't accidentally end up plagiarizing other people's work. The consequences of plagiarism are very severe. Um, it's regarded as, as theft or piracy. Uh, and the GSA has very strict rules on plagiarism as well as other academic offences. Um, and you're likely to be penalised quite heavily if, if you submit work in which plagiarism has occurred, whether or not you meant it. Um, so it's very important that you take steps to ensure that you never accidentally end up plagiarizing somebody's work. And my advice for you there is that you never ever drop something into your work without including the citation and the referencing information with it. And you make sure that that link is never broken between the citation uh, information and the quote or the image that it, that it refers to. So never paste anything in without also 
citing it at the same time. That would be my advice. OK, so to recap um, the, the homework that I've asked you to do at the end of this video, have a look at the InfoSmart training. Why not make it um, one of your uh, personal or professional development goals um, coming up? It will pay you back the hours you put into it. Um, here are some other resources that you might want to consult in terms of self-directed research. There's the InfoSmart link again. You've also got the library at GSA, which is open uh, digitally even during um, the pandemic. Um, there are, is also a link there to GSA archives and collections, which you can explore and learning technology information there as well. And this last link here is um, the guide that I use for how to cite literally everything uh, in the Harvard format, which is expected at GSA. So please do have a look at that if you need help on Harvard formatting. I hope this was very useful. Thank you very much for listening and please do have a look at the other videos in this series. Thanks.